But I'm going to dive right in right now to the extent that I have, uh, uh, Michael, I have been steeped in this for Virginia Public Radio because Virginia is getting walloped in particular by the um, voracious demand that a handful of hedge funds have for uh, regional newspapers, including your own, the Richmond Times Dispatch, which is owned by Lee Enterprises, uh, which was briefly owned by Warren Buffett. I remember when he acquired it, roughly what eight nine years ago, he said that people uh, uh, tr- picnics, church picnics, are still going to uh, advertise in local newspapers. They're not going anywhere. You fast forward, he spun it off to Lee, and he said that local news is toast. And now you guys are staring down the barrel of a of a hedge fund that's been known to strip and flip and kind of ride out late stage newspapers. What what are your thoughts? I mean, I know you've lost many colleagues over the last three months. Yeah, um, going back to um, Mr. Buffett, I, I just, I took his acquisition of sure. the media general newspapers as a labor of love, because I simply could not believe that the Oracle of Omaha would look at the newspaper industry and see a windfall. Um, newspapers still make money, but it, it, I, I just did not think um, that the disillusionment that he expressed years down the road that we weren't more profitable, um, I just didn't see that coming. Um, I thought he viewed newspapers uh, as the fourth estate, a public service, something that's not your usual typical business. Mm. And um, it, so that was disappointing. And so here we are, um, like a lot of newspapers in um, uh, the situation that we're in, where we're fighting off hedge funds, um, um, shedding staff, and who ends up being the loser in that? Well, obviously the newspaper employees who lose their jobs, but also our readers. Um, And none of that to our topic du jour is good for democracy. Professor Perryman, what is it about newspapers? They used to have these toothsome cash flows back in the day when people are nostalgic about the era, the drink carts. It's almost this mad men like fatigue. There was no Craigslist to worry about, no Google or Facebook with the advertising duopoly sucking up all the, you know, ad revenue for newspapers. I grew up reading the Miami Herald and it was big and it was thick and you you would dream of being someone like a Carl Hyacin or a Dave Barry or Edna Buchanan. Um, you know, you'd go to J school, you'd take on that debt and everything in the hopes of, of working at a at a, at, a, at a newspaper and kind of cutting your teeth and becoming a Pulitzer Prize winner or breaking a news story. Uh, now, uh, what you're seeing is actually the have lots and the have really littles. Uh, the, the New York Times has kind of figured its way out of this, has gotten people to pay dearly for digital subscriptions and audio and video and crosswords and Wordle and whatever you want to call it. The Boston Globe has a billionaire backstop. The Wall Street Journal was acquired by Rupert Murdoch, for better or for worse. The Los Angeles Times acquired one of the by one of the wealthiest people in California. Is there kind of any other way out of this? Have any other models struck you as as sustainable? Is or is it just charity versus billionaire? Well if you've if you if you want to know why newspapers were so important, right? It was the smell and the crinkle sound they make when you when you lay them out, right? You just you can't uh, you can't beat that. <laughs> so I, I hope I hope it doesn't completely go away, but it, it really seems like that might be the direction that we're headed. Um, we're seeing um, an increase in, of course, uh, hedge funds slash philanthropists who really want to save local newspapers. So you're seeing a renewed interest in that. But more than anything, you're seeing a move towards nonprofit. Um, nonprofit that, by choice. Yes. And that seems to be sort of a, um, I, I was just looking at some data from Pew uh, Research Center about how 20% of the uh, state reporters in the country are now nonprofit reporters, which is a very, it was, that's about four times as many as there were in 2014. So a, a massive increase. So we're seeing a move towards that in a way, because we're, we know that 
we interestingly as the world moves more towards a subscription model we're not sure that subscription models will ever be profitable again for news even though everything else seems to be a subscription now um and you know you got your netflix and whatnot um but that model is, is a very popular funding model but of course it, it didn't work out so well for most newspapers um after ad revenue dried up when mostly due to of course google and Facebook sucking up those dollars more so than anything else. Um, but that'd be one trend that I, I find very interesting. But the question of how will local newspapers, the few that are left, because we are we are losing them fast and furiously. I mean, it's been a mass dieout since yes. the turn of the century. <laughs> and even insane. if, you know, you could see the Pew numbers since the financial crisis. And it's uh, still going and it, it, there doesn't seem to be an insight, but I, it's interesting when you go to these, I go to tons of journalism conferences and it's always, of course, everybody's like, does anyone, has anyone figured out the new funding model yet? And of course nobody has. <laughs> but, Shireen, jump in. Have other countries done it in a better way? Why do I think tangentially Canada or Australia or New Zealand, or somebody has a sense for, the public utility and the public good, not to just leave this to the, you know, caprice of uh, shareholders or, or wealthy families. Right. Well, I, I can't speak to the, the 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 globe, but I will say that people are coming. Um, certainly, they're coming to the Institute for Nonprofit News to find out how American North American nonprofits are doing it, and that includes Canada and the Caribbean. Um, so we've seen a rapid growth of our membership over the last five years, and especially over the last three years, believe it or not, during the pandemic, more uh, nonprofit news organizations are joining. Some of them are startups, but not all. Some of them are conversions. Some of them are tiny, but not all. Um, I was just looking at our most recent uh, index data, and we have a new one coming out in a couple of weeks. Mallory, I'm sure you'll be interested to, to see the data, but you know, about 20% of the membership has operating budgets of 2 million or more. Again, not they're not huge, but they're also not, you know, in infinitesimal and more than a quarter have staffs, you know, in the in the dozens. So while there's this perception that there are all these kind of mom and pop shops, you know, taking the place of the newspapers that have failed, that's actually not the case. And we're seeing not only more of these organizations, but their revenues are diversifying so that organizations that initially started out with foundation funding or maybe one or two key donors are now attracting more donations in the five to 10,000 and above range, more regional and community foundations that are stepping in to join the national ones that kind of led the charge and more earned revenue from advertising, business sponsorships, and events. So it's, you know, it's sort of a myth that nonprofits can't take advertising. They do, but it's a much more kind of selective, kind of locally oriented advertising. And sometimes it's what they call a business membership, where the business, they want the eyeballs, but they also kind of want the goodwill and they want to reach a certain audience that that local newspaper reaches. And so they'll do a sponsorship. So I do think there is some hope for a different model. <clears throat> Michael, take me back to graduating from uh, journalism school. You shared with me how important was it Northwestern, yes. Northwestern School of Journalism was, and the journey to becoming, you know, uh, to being at a desired uh, uh, paper where you could establish a voice and a corner and a community and uh, really carve out a name for yourself. Well, um, God, I can barely remember. It was 40 When years did ago. you come to Richmond? Um, I, I am a Richmond native, and I worked at the Times Dispatch for my entire career, which wow. makes me an anomaly. And certainly, um, um, I'm, I've, my, my type has gone the way of the dinosaur. You won't find um, journalist, newspaper journalists who are going to work 40 years at the same newspaper again. Those days are done. Um, but when I entered the newspaper business in the early 1980s, even wow. though we were in the midst of a recession, um, newspapers were still a license to print money. And um, there were just all sorts of extravagances that, that I witnessed over the next decade that made you think the good times would always be there. Um, and that hasn't been the case, uh, obviously. And the internet um, was the major turning point. What was going through your mind when you got on Netscape in 1994, 1995, and they put all this stuff up? We used, we, they, they brought the, the computers in the newsroom and told us to play games on them to get accustomed to using them. So I, I remember a lot of time spent playing Jeopardy and, and online games. It was a gas. And you just did not take it seriously. I mean, it's easy um, in hindsight to cast aspersion at, at the people who ran newspapers for not having more vision 
um, for not buying Google, Google, getting in on the ground floor and, and scooping that up, and we'd all be good at that point. No, you didn't see that coming in. Just the decision to give it away. It, it wasn't taken seriously, clearly. Although, riddle me this. Uh, you are smarter people than I am. Why do they get to use, why do the Googles of the world, why do the Facebooks of the world, why do the Twitters of the world get to use our content and not remunerate us one penny? Please explain that to me. Dr. Per Dr. Perryman, jump in. Well, they'd had an agreement at one point and it did not work out well. <laughs> it was, it went from, there was something special. It was like Facebook news or something. And they were gonna give news organizations a cut or a certain percentage of um, the revenue from all of the clicks. And uh, I don't know what happened to that. I'm pretty sure it's no longer it's no longer a thing. That's interesting. Um, I it, mean, do they do they share metrics with you, Michael, of how many people come straight to the RTD's website for your copy versus those who access it through Google or Facebook or Twitter or some other fast track channel where they can capture the rents? Uh, I'm sure they do, but all that's way above my pay grade. I'm just a a country journalist. <laughs> Well, Shireen, tell me about uh, some of the papers, some of the organizations that have stuck to the not-for-profit uh, model. I mean, certainly in my world, in public media, this you mm -hmm. kind of live by the pledge drive and die by the pledge drive, and um, it, it has, you know, it has worked, especially during the Trump bump for uh, several public radio affiliates. That suddenly, when people realize that democracy might, democracy might be jeopardized, it behooves you to chip in. I mean, it's actually, you know, they, they, can, they make the case ad nauseum over the radio that it's a good deal that you're getting. But that doesn't resonate with younger listeners necessarily. There's a there's an actuarial and generational divide with the whole pledge drive thing. You don't have people listening to radio or watching right. linear TV as much. Talk to me about that. Yeah. So what we see our members doing is, you know, they've adapted to, to the market, right? So it's it's email newsletters. It's and it's not an annual pledge. It's a, it's a recurring thing. Um, they don't so much use the term subscriptions because most of our members don't have paywalls, believe it or not. Um, and most of them share their content freely, including with for profit publishers. So like if we have 360 members, there are about 6000 media outlets that actually republish the content. But still, in terms of the subscription model, we think of it more as a membership model. So you have organizations. And I think this is appealing to the younger people. It's like, hey, you know, you're one of us, right? You're like, you're part of this effort that we that we have. And so can you chip in $10 a month or $20, $20 a month? So it's more of a recurring contribution. And then, yes, they do do their end of year fundraising campaigns like any nonprofit. And we have a program called Newsmatch where um, a lot of our members are eligible. And if they raise a certain amount, it's usually between 10 and 12, 20,000, this national pool of funders will match that amount. So that's a way to kind of get a little end of year spark going. Um, but honestly, I think it's much more, the appeal is much more like tugging at the heartstrings. Like it's important for you to have us here. And therefore, just like you could give to the local library or you give to the, the hospital pledge drive or you support the volunteer ambulance company, support us because we're here and we've got your back. I have to ask you, I have a lot of New York Times envy. I was a fellow there during business school, and for the longest time, they brought in McKinsey and the others. They said, how do we thread this thing? We don't want to go slash and burn. We don't want to follow a lot of these regional newspapers that thought that you could cut your way to sustainable profitability and a higher stock price. They stuck with the newsroom. They stuck with FedExing the flak jackets to Iraq and everything. And finally, finally, that paid off, especially in the Trump bump, where if you look at the earnings right now, they don't care if print advertising is hemorrhaging in the double digits because they have such a pop of digital subscribers. People have been trained to pay and to pay dearly uh, to the extent that they can go out and buy, what was it, The Athletic recently? I mean, that they go in and disrupt NPR by, by putting out The Daily, that they have a brand studio internally. I don't know of any other newspaper that has done that without a billionaire backstop, Dr. Perryman. They haven't. The New York Times is a, is a, a beast. <laughs> in the in the in the news world i mean there there's no and i think you're, you're pointing out something really important they're the only ones who have done it that way and they're probably the only ones who can do it that way because there's only so much space I mean, you can't replicate that that model um on a local level um and it works for the times and thank goodness it does um but national news organizations overall your flagship media organizations the new york times the washington post the wall street journal and then of course all the networks nbc abc cbs and the cable channels they're they're not the one, not the ones in trouble. They're they have their 
their struggles, of course, but like they're fine. Like the big guys are doing okay. And what we're having a trouble with is the local folks. And that's, uh, that to me is far scarier than the prospect of losing CNN. <laughs> well, what about, what about the, the likes of Axios and the other digital natives that have venture funding or private equity funding that can swoop into a news desert, such as Richmond? I believe Axios They're Richmond here. just <laughs> launched and maybe with two people. But again, you got to collect the hard copy, the hard kind of school board meeting stuff. Michael, from from actual workers out there doing it, you could only fill a newspaper with so much AP and Bloomberg copy and Reuters copy. Yeah, um, yeah, we've we've watched Axios come in with interest and um, wonder if that represents um, the new model, um, kind of national models coming in and localizing. Uh, remains to be seen um, how that works and why it would work better um, for them than the people who are actually here on the ground um, in a place like Richmond. Um, I take, look, I, I always paraphrase when I do episodes on this. I think it was naughty by nature, 1991, 1992. I, I paraphrase and say, you down with OPC, other people's content. So Axios and Politico and the others are kind of scraping for these newsletters. They get these great links, Morning Brew and others, but I, I have not been impressed that there's a lot of shoe leather reporting. And that, and, and you know, venture capitalists would like that. It's asset light, it's employee light, it's unionization light. But it's it's the way people consume, or I'd say a n- growing number of people, and maybe it's generational, maybe it's not, but consume information in, in the kind of bits that Axios <laughs> provides. And, and I don't know if that means we need to adjust to the times, uh, I sus- or legacy media, media, I suspect it does, but going back to an earlier point, I mean, the fact that we have to convince people that we are essential is extremely problematic mm. because regardless of how they feel about whether we're essential or not, we are. And if we fail, they fail. And, and, and the system doesn't work. The system doesn't work without local newspapers on so many levels. So uh, there's a failure at some point. I don't know if it's in the education system, which is the emphasized civics lessons or, or, or what. And, and you know, we, we need to learn how to be responsible citizens again. And part of that is being a discerning news consumer. And that doesn't always mean going for the national model, although that's important, or, or consuming in little bits. Um, so, I think there are some challenges all around there. I think about South Florida, Shireen, and the Miami Herald that I grew up with, McClatchy, the parent company, it merged. It was a mega merger with Knight Ritter. I mean, it was unthinkable back in the day. The Miami Herald was king. It broke the Gary Hart you know, story. I mean, going back, just launched so many great uh, reporters and columnists and everything. That now, McClatchy has failed, and it has capitulated to a hedge fund. And uh, uptown, you have the Sun Sentinel, which was owned by Tribune, which has also capitulated to a hedge fund. What is the end game? Right. You know, I, I mean, people down there keep romancing some uh, uh, noblesse oblige or some Latin American billionaire is going to come in and just decide that this will be my my bauble and my gift to Miami. But that hasn't happened. Right. And I'm, I'm, I want to just piggyback on what Michael said about the essential nature, right? I, I do actually think, and, and this is me personally, maybe this is not the INN position, but I do feel like it's happening at the high school level, right? If kids are coming out and they're not taught to distinguish fact from opinion, right? Then right there, we have a problem with our news consumers and their habits, right? And so you have people who have kind of fallen into that 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 national model of either watching MSNBC or Fox and kind of believing what you're what is sort of spat at you. So I do feel like that the process may take a little more time than we would all like. I don't think it's just a financial and an economic model issue. I think it's also a cultural issue of people, uh, right? Of people not sort of understanding how to be discerning news consumers. Um, and so the, the the flip side, I think, has to be, and where we're trying to go, is to 
sort of reframe this as a public good, right? As we were talking about before, in the way that people support, you know, their, their libraries, it kind of has to be seen like that because we know the research shows that when people have local news, they vote more. There, there are more candidates running for office, right? People are more likely to be civically engaged and even to volunteer and actually local economies tend to function better. And also people report having a greater sense of satisfaction with their community, right? And the ability to kind of talk across the fence in a way that we've completely lost. So I, I do think it's essential and I think it part of it is economic, but I don't think that's all of it. And I think part of the why we're seeing this divide is because there's this cultural entrenchment happening where people have sort of lost the ability to have to take that broader perspective and to form their own conclusions. And again, that's more my personal uh, opinion, but I, I do see it across the board. <clears throat> I'm sorry to keep bringing it back to kind of a business sensibility, but it's been such an elusive question for me, and I've covered it in many episodes, Shireen. But what, again, if you could, if you could set up a roll up and get venture funding or you know uh, patrons of the art funding and everything, and hire every great journalist who takes a buyout from every great paper and put it up and say you can work from anywhere, would you able, would you be able to sustainably run? an ambitious news enterprise. Look at the Texas Tribune, right? So one of our members, they cover state politics and they do deep investigations in Texas. It was co-founded, right, by Evan Smith and he's now brought on Sewell Chan to be his editor in chief, right? These are major accomplished journalists who are choosing to work at this organization that's what, about 13 years old. Uh, they're raising tens of millions of dollars. They're speaking truth to power and they're not backing down. So I do think it's possible to run a significant sizable news organization and pay people appropriately. Tease that out for me. What drives it for them? I hear that their events are extremely well attended. Yeah. You know, they figured out the reader revenue. You know, they have figured out how to do other things that bring in money uh, in addition to the donations and in addition to the, you know, the, the ads and the and the foundation money. So they have a diversified revenue stream. Uh, they have great personalities. Um, and somehow they managed to walk that partisan divide and kind of, you know, report on everything that's going on in Texas, which of course is a fascinating state to report on. So they do have that going for them. Why hasn't this happened more in stereo in places that have kind of faced that, that hedge fund guillotine, Philadelphia, Denver, uh, as Miami, as I said, why haven't you seen this model or somebody try to serialize it or apply it to other places that are becoming impending news deserts? I'll just say, I do think some of it's leadership, Robin. I do think some of it's leadership. But you what know? is that? I mean, what, what does it take if a mayor calls you, if a, oh gosh, if a, you know, let's say, a, I don't know, a Jim Ucrop from Richmond or somebody who's known as the, the, the I don't know, the paternal, right. you know, well, Stuart Bainham tried it in Baltimore and other right. places. If you get a consortium of people together, a university, tell me about what happened in Chicago with the public was it a public radio station WBEZ and the EZ and the Chicago Sun Times? The Chicago Sun Times, which was orphaned. Right. right. So it's now merging with the with the main public radio station out there under one big nonprofit umbrella. But I will say, you know, Robin, one of our affiliate members is American Journalism Project. Are you all familiar with them? So they, they are taking more of that kind of uh, social impact VC model, right? Where they'll go into a major metro area and they'll try to help start uh, a more sizable publication with like, again, more sizable contributions. So AJP I think is doing a lot on what you're talking about of trying to ramp up uh, the size, uh, but there still is that need for those small community-based papers that aren't gonna get that kind of money because they're just not as, um, they're not as sexy, right? To cover, you know, South side of Chicago may not seem as sexy, uh, but it still has a great need. I, I think um, we can't, have a discussion about um, the news media and newspapers and democracy and the economics of it and, and the impact of technology without acknowledging that over much of this period, even beyond this period, dating back at least in my memory to the 1980s, there has been a concerted effort, especially on the political right, to discredit the news media. And it's been very effective to, to foment distrust in the news media. Now you can you can um, you can um, you know we can we can debate motives, but it's been undeniable, um, you know. And, and this occurred 
concurrently with the rise of Fox News, the rise of, of right wing talk radio and people like Rush Limbaugh who were doing that sort of work to discredit um, the media. And now it's become mainstream politics. Um, recall Sarah Palin's comments about the lamestream media and, and that morphed into Donald Trump's fake news. So the people in the highest places of government um, and, and otherwise have, have um, encouraged what is happening now. And we can't ignore that fact that the demise of newspapers and, and other media has been something that they have coveted. Is it too cute of me to discuss login fatigue, right? We saw Netflix kind of capitulate a couple of weeks ago and start a stock market route and saying that many people out there, look, our numbers might not have been as hail as possible because many people are mooching on one another's uh, logins. And every time I want to read a great story, Dr. Perryman, you know, I hit up against the two article, three article paywall, and I am a consumer of news. And I subscribe to various newspapers, and I give to my member station, and I give to PBS. But at some point, it kind of becomes ridiculous when you consider you have Spotify, Netflix, three or four newspaper subscriptions, public radio, public TV, and everybody is hitting you up along the way. Uh, what's going on? And, and is there a better mousetrap? So this is a really interesting question as we were talking about different news consumption habits, especially among different demographic groups. So news has been in for a reckoning for some time with changing consumption habits. And most people, you know, blame the digital era and, you know, everything going online, but it's actually broadcast. You really need to look at for um, the reckoning that is soon to be upon us as you realize that the age of broadcast news consumers is, is much, much older. Um, than the median age of the United States. Young people do not tune in <laughs> to broadcast news. They do not watch the local morning news, except for they all seem to know who Andrew Frieden is. Um, he's weirdly a celebrity in my, my classes. Everybody's a big Andrew Frieden fan. I am too, but um, <laughs> it just always struck me as kind of random. Um, but they, they're, not, they're not appointment viewers. They don't, they don't even have, you know, they can't even bother getting an antenna to go in their, on their TV and watch it for free. Um, and they don't, they don't really, they watch videos, of course, but on TikTok, and they're certainly not looking for news there, and they don't want it there, I'll tell you that. Um, so you've got this whole, you've got this whole generation coming up with a very different consumption habit, but I'll tell you what, there is hope. These young folks uh, are really into um, brands, so not necessarily consumer brands. They, they trust people more than they trust organizations. They they like Andrew Frieden, right? But they don't, I mean, if I ask them other feelings about NBC 12, I'm not sure they feel so strongly about it. Um, they gravitate towards people that they like and they like to listen to. Now, they don't necessarily have to share their opinions. They just find them interesting and they'll follow what they have to say. So they will tune in and they will, they will watch and they will read, but they're very selective about the voices that they're listening to. More so the people, the bylines seem to matter to them a little bit more than the actual organizations. I think the organizations are very caught up in this idea of media for them, but the people that they like, the journalists, and I don't know that they can think of them as journalists as much as they think of them as investigators or truth tellers, or which is kind of what journalists are, but nice. maybe, maybe a rebrand there as well. Um, but you are seeing a little bit of that. So I, I don't know that, you know, these kids are not going to pay for every subscription under the sun and have be breaking down paywalls left and right, but they are paying attention. It's just that they're paying attention in a little bit different way than we're used to. Michael, what do you think about that? I mean, time was, you, you know, I would say that an association with something like the Miami Herald or the New York Times or the Boston Globe would have meant so much to me. But now that you've really established your name on your own, you have a widely followed Twitter handle, people can connect to you on LinkedIn or whatever channels you're on. They can opt into you and kind of synthetically build their own newspaper with their favorite bylines and experts and uh, people from ESPN, people from across the planet tracking demography, Pew, INN. Um, has that given you some sort of uh, uh, inoculation from the vagaries of the newspaper business? Uh, no, I'm not nearly that big enough. But um, the, Mallory raises some interesting points that I hadn't thought of. Um, she probably knows that the Times-Dispatch um, uh, several years ago got into the meteorology business wholesale. Um, weather used to be something we covered ad hoc. Um, whoever happened to have that particular shift had to make some calls to the National Weather Service. And we just kind of winged it. And 
Um, a few years ago, we hired a, a gentleman named John Boyer, and he was our first real meteorologist. And um, he left, and now we have Sean Sublet. But we, you know, it, when we hired John Boyer, when we hired a meteorologist, there, there were a lot of um, puzzling, puzzled looks in the newsroom. But now you can't imagine a newspaper without one because of climate change. So it's a real thing now. So maybe that's part of what's going on with Andrew Frieden. Um, something else I thought of when Mallory was talking, it was like I'm a big basketball fan. And they keep saying the NBA is a star-driven league. And that's what journalism has become. I mean, in our celebrity culture, I mean, just think about how we, Donald Trump was a celebrity who got elected president. He didn't get elected president because he was a statesman or a politician. And that's just how we roll generationally and, and culturally now. And, and I guess people move toward names they know more so than institutions, whereas institutions, I guess to Mallory's point, used to be the thing. Um, now people select the people from the New York Times that they dig and, and, and the Washington Post and various news organizations. So it's, it's just, I don't know if we've adjusted as an industry to all these, that we need someone to really study all this and, 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 and kind of give meaning to it. Well, they I like you, Michael, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I have a comment from attendee Martha Steger to the panelists and attendees. She writes, I agree we've had a generational problem for some time. Even 22 to 23 years ago in teaching a VCU communications class, I asked students where they got their news and the majority said Facebook. And I got to tell you, when I was first invited here and I gave a lecture at the Robertson School and I wanted to break an ice, break the ice with these millennials, I go, what do you guys watch on TV? It, you know, it was Judy Crenshaw's class, I think, eight years ago. And they all look around like, mister, we don't watch TV. You know, one one's landlord threw in Fios and an old used TV. And that's got to change your I mean, I mean, and fast forward now and, and, and Shireen, it's all mobile. I wanted to use this transition to ask you how uh, the radio and TV world are being disrupted in this, because in public broadcasting, at least that's decidedly not for profit. But they haven't been nearly as aggressive uh, versus the likes of. Netflix or Spotify or Stitcher or the for-profit uh, platforms, the apps that are really extracting the rents on the right. tablet and the smartphone. I mean, we see most of our publications are digital first, but most of them are print, right? That you read them in some way. But I will say more and more are getting into podcasts and a handful are, are radio and some are even actual public media uh, members as well. Um, the interesting thing now is, right, you can even listen in your car because your car is Wi-Fi enabled or you can connect your phone. So you could have a subscription to Sirius and be listening to the news on Sirius or whatever other. So I am curious to see how that affects, I think, our 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 members are starting to wonder what other formats they, they should be in. But Mallory, to your point, you know, younger people are not watching news on television and they're for the most part, really not listening to it on the radio. So whether that's gonna come back around, I don't know. But one interesting thing we've seen is that our members have been trying to reach people where they are. So for example, during the pandemic, some of the members started using text messaging because they realized that in certain, uh, especially in urban neighborhoods where there was a uh, lower uh, income households who didn't necessarily have Wi-Fi in their apartments, but they needed to know things like where to get masks or where the food bank was, was serving out food, um, where to find COVID information. So they started a text messaging service where the reporters were then directly communicating with the readers and the readers could send in questions and the reporters would answer them. And they started getting thousands of, of chains going back and forth, whether that's financially viable is another question, um, but it really earned them um, the loyalty of a lot of uh, listeners and viewers. We've also seen more recently WhatsApp being used by the members because a lot of um, immigrants are not necessarily using, they're not even really on Facebook and Twitter as much. They're using WhatsApp to communicate, right? It's, a, it's an app on your phone. It's a cheap way of communicating both with your home country and with people in this country. So some of our members are using WhatsApp to send out their newsletters. So I think that the formats will continue to change. And maybe the question is not, you know, what should we do about radio and TV, but what are we doing to, map, to keep pace with people's consumption habits? <clears throat> Dr. Perryman. Uh, I'm never one to resist the urge to quote a lyric, especially from the 80s. Uh, I believe the children are the future. You teach them well and let them lead the way. And I think about students and your students a lot. I'm an, uh, an adjunct, a journalist in residence at the University of Richmond, 
Robin School. And when I have students come and approach me and discuss how writing is going to be involved in their careers or broadcast work, a lot of times it's for journalist adjacent stuff, such as brand management or going into a company and doing a private label podcast. How do you, with a with an honest face, look at a 20-year-old and say, yes, I'm going to guide you into a journalism career. There's so little visibility. There's no social contract. There's no guarantee that anybody can promote you into a, a living wage, much less a, a serious, sustainable career. Um, to be totally honest with you, I am totally honest with them. I My students very often do not go into journalism. In fact, I would say probably right now about 70% of our graduates are not actually, or they're, or they're even their first jobs, they might stay for like a two-year contract and then they usually up and leave. And it's it, for so many reasons, burnout, um, the hours are terrible and the pay, I mean, the pay is just I mean, this isn't a living wage for a lot of these, these people. I mean, even in a small market, it's just, it's crumbs. I mean, they can, they can now make more money working at, at Starbucks. And so it helps me to let them know that it is <laughs> sort of a thankless, you have to, it's a calling for a lot of them, right? They have to really believe in what they're doing. Um, and I, I let them know right from the beginning that every skill that they're learning is going to come in handy no matter what they do. And in the worst case scenario, they leave and they're an excellent writer and they're a good storyteller and they have an appreciation for journalism that they didn't have before. And maybe they go out there and fight for it. And that's what I ask. I'm like, if you're not going to practice it, at least fight for it. Um, because there's, you, you don't have to, you don't have to suffer in the newsroom if it's not what you want to do. Um, but I have to be realistic with them at this point. It is a very difficult career path. Um, and some of them do it and they love it. And I have some who are super successful and they do work their way up the ladder. Um, and they find a place they really love and they, and they find a good newsroom, but I would say probably about three out of four of them do not. Um, they do find great jobs. I'll, I'll give them that. It's certainly not a, I, I, I can truthfully tell them it's a worthwhile degree. Um, I just can't tell them with a straight face that this is going to be a successful career for them because I, I do not know that. <laughs> um, I had hope it, but I don't know it. Michael, how many cub reporters and prospective reporters contact you every month for advice or some some degree of handholding? Um, not too many, actually. Um, I, some, um, probably my share. But to the, the the point you all are making, I mean, of, of course, I went into this business forty years ago because I wanted to get rich. I mean, no, <laughs> it's. That's of all the change we're talking about, that's the part that's least changed. Yeah, but here, let me push <laughs> back. It's knowing it's, that the pay sucks. It's, it's, it's existential. security it's, that's the problem. It's existential. There's true job insecurity. If you always yeah. have this sword of Damocles above you, yeah. if you're worried about gigging and hustling and doing side things just to hang on to a passion, and it's especially exacerbated uh, the 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 demographic differences. I mean, people who have wealthy parents or, or trust fund kids who could go to a program and take on a vanity major, that's one thing. It's all other thing to ask a working undergrad to take an unpaid internship or a low paid internship and, and think about that as a career afterwards. There are very few backstops. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I'm, I'm constantly amazed at the steady stream of young people who continue to pursue this as a career. I mean, I, I have to resent resist the temptation to ask them if they're, they've lost their minds. And, and year in and year out, they came, they come pouring into our newsrooms as interns or in, and eventual hires. And all I can say is um, one of the best things about being a, the, the people I've worked with are some of the finest people I will ever know. They, they aren't in it. They're in it because they truly want to make a difference. Shireen, amid all the doom and gloom, kind of in the stretch run of this interview, surely there's some paradoxical findings and factoids and trends that you can share with us. Because look, this has been flogged so many times uh, by Pew, by the Columbia Journalism Review, by every J school, by every professor, by every journalist saying I'm, I'm leaving and going into PR or storytelling. Give yeah. us some good news. Give us some well, glimmers. I will say, you know, and some of this is anecdotal, but first of all, so at INN, we have a number of partnerships with universities to bring in interns, right? Um, either 
people who are still in school or their first one or two years outside of school. And we kind of have a policy that all of our internships that we're involved with have to be paid, right? So if we help place a, a, an intern at a member news organization, they are gonna get paid for that time. Uh, generally speaking, we pull in some institutional funding and then the newsroom matches part of it. So that person, so that's one small step to try to get around that whole, like I can't even afford to take an internship to get my foot in the door conundrum that frankly I was in when I got out of college, I couldn't afford to work for free. Um, another thing I'm seeing just on our listserv where the members kind of throw out questions and answer is they're really thinking about the work-life balance and sort of quality of life. So they're having questions like, um, do you guys have like, what's your paid leave policy? And we're thinking about implementing a sabbatical and how should it be every three years? And, you know, what are you doing about, you know, pregnancy leave if you're a small organization and what kind of benefits are you offering? So even though a lot of them are smaller shops, they're really thinking about how to make work a part of a person's life, but not like all of a person's life. And I think I think journalism. I did. I never worked in a newsroom, but from what I hear, you know, it, it was terrible. Like the hours you were sort of on call forever. And so I think there's this awareness that it is a job and it is a calling, but it is part of someone's life. Um, and I guess the the other encouraging thing is Robin, like it's not just a question of fixing the way things were, but maybe reimagining how they could be different. So we started tracking diversity in the member newsrooms and we found that compared with industry data overall, our newsrooms are slightly more diverse. There's still a ways to go, but the leadership is about 50% or more women, uh, which again has historically not been the case in newsrooms, right? With top positions for editors in chief and publishers going to women. So I do feel like there's this directional trend toward more diversity, um, both at the at the entry levels, but also at the mid and, and senior levels. Um, We've got founders and entrepreneurs or people of color who are coming up from their communities who want to go back and serve their communities. And frankly, they're able to tap into other kinds of support because they're able to do other kinds of reporting. So it's not the case of Axios parachuting in and reporting on a community. It's people coming up, reporting with the community that they know. So I'm hopeful that the money will meet, <laughs> will meet that need and that vision. <clears throat> Dr. Perryman, why aren't universities more natural allies for uh, local newspapers, especially if they could start from scratch? You know, you don't have to worry about the printing press. You could be digital natives. You have embedded mentors, a program that would churn out graduates with real applicable skills and bylines. I mean, you see it with the overlap. They call it the TIAA overlap with NPR stations and universities, you know, KUNC, Virginia Tech and, and, and Radio IQ. Uh, WBUR and Boston University. Why haven't you seen this more with uh, newspapers and, and universities, which after all do have a fundraising capability, do have uh, parallel missions, can get donors excited about a J school and other adjacencies such as communications or podcasting or brand management? So I'm a, um, I had done my undergraduate in broadcast journalism at the University of Missouri, which is well known for its hospital method of teaching with journalism. They actually own the local NBC affiliate. They um, run the local newspaper and they have an affiliation with the local NPR station. So it's that model. Um, the difference between Mizzou and of course somewhere like BCU is they have about a um, hundred times more <laughs> staff members working in the journalism program there. So even a school like BCU, we have a fairly large journalism program, one of the largest in the state. And we still actually only have about eight journalism faculty on staff, right? So there's very few of us. And of course, when you're talking about cub reporters, everything needs to be fact-checked about three times um, and then often rewritten several times. So it's, it's a lot, it's just, it's very labor intensive, but um, you do see uh, an increased interest in this. And in fact, I was looking for some numbers from Pew. I, I Apparently I just spend all day on Pew research, um, but they had some really great numbers about the number of student reporters who are reporting in state houses besides the nonprofits. It's a lot of student reporters now. You're actually seeing them sort of fill in these gaps. And a lot of universities are thinking that way, including VCU, when we see local news disappearing in these ways. And you know, our first instinct is to say, well, what can, what can we do? What can our students do um, to fill in those gaps? Um, and it's hard work um, and the local, you know, the student newspapers do their share of reporting on campus, but to actually, like, you know, we do put students in the state house here. We put 
them in the Capitol with our Capitol News Service. And we report and our stories are distributed across the Associated Press and they appear in the Washington Post. And it's great for our students, but it's an enormous amount of oversight. Um, and that's the key issue too. So not, o- not only are newsrooms understaffed, journalism schools are <laughs> also fairly understaffed. Michael, what about these narrow verticals? You know, here, uh, to be honest, more people talk about the, you know, Richmond Biz Sense, which was, uh, I guess, a guy who worked at the Times Dispatch who was frustrated, an editor with the business section, and its inability to innovate goes off and does something that's digital native, hires a bunch of hungry young reporters. A lot of it is newsletter-ish, where they're providing intelligence reports for real estate investors and legal reports and subscription events and the like. And then you have the Virginia Mercury, which is more kind of a uh, they, they, they got benefactors, uh, the, the Virginia Cardinal or, or, or some others. There are a handful of niche players kind of stepping in and, and hiring these reporters before they leave town. Yeah, well, um, you know, there, there's a market out there. I mean, when you look at how newspapers are no, no, you know, not staffed anywhere near to the extent they used to be, you know, there are a lot of young journalists out there who need employment. So, I mean, there's that. Um, yeah. But when you talk about the political playbook or Richmond Biz Sense, you know, commercial real estate report, or, uh, th- th- you know, these are super directly targeted. And you talk about news you can use. This is yeah, really think, like. Yeah, I think I think people have moved away from the general, the idea of a one size fits all kind of general news application mm-hmm. that the traditional legacy newspaper represents. And, and, you know, it's just like online. People self-select their interests. They, sex, they self-select their political leanings. You know, people just go to their points of interest now. Um, they're, they're no longer generalist, I think, when it comes to news consumption. And, and um, yeah, that's got to hurt, I think, um, you know, the traditional newspaper. And um, I, I think we have to adjust in that way. Sharina Zimi of the Institute for Nonprofit News, when is this, you know, fast forward this for me. It's just, I have I've came into journalism, professional journalism in 2000, and that's kind of when you felt things turn, when the web was not your friend and it was cannibalizing from the print business and you started even in great economies having secular layoffs and constant downsizing and mergers and acquisitions and right-sizing EBITDA margins. Does this just go on ad infinitum? Is there any kind of you know terrifying moment where you could stand up in front of Congress or state capitals and say this is a national crisis? Look, there are things happening in Congress, right? There is the there is the uh, Rebuild no- Local News Coalition, as some of you know, right, which has many many signatories. The INN is one of them. Um, there is legislation uh, looking at ways to bring in some public money for news, and obviously that gets concerning because people don't want there to be any, you know. Um, conflict, but you know, it's, it's happened with public media over the years, right? Those, those stations get money. And so they're looking at ways to possibly either bring in public dollars or create incentives, whether it's tax breaks and incentives to help local news stay uh, afloat. My understanding is that one of the issues is part of the way that local newspapers kept going is that they would run those uh, government backed ads, right? Those sort of announcements and things that had to be given public notice. Um, and if that goes away, then the pages get thinner and it becomes it becomes harder. So they're look, they are looking at new models. I do think that there are people in, in Congress and government who realize that, that it's a crisis. Um, and there are there is some bipartisan support to come up with solutions, um, but it's, you know, it's bit by bit. <laughs> I just remember the indignation covering subprime crisis where back then they would talk about private profits and socialized risk and General Motors gets bailed out because it's considered systemically important. AIG gets bailed out because it's systemically important. The obverse is too terrifying to ponder. Uh, but you know, going back to your point, Michael, when you're saying, when are people going to realize that you have to be really worried about this and discriminating about your news consumption, that they're going to say, okay, we have to get some sort of package together, some different way of thinking. Certainly the free market has not done justice to, to kind of the public mission. Yeah. Um, it, it's kind of the, the best of times and the worst of times. I, the Times suggests that newspapers, among other media, should be uh, uh, 
at their peak because there's just so much need. Um, there's just so much crisis. Um, we, we're literally at a crisis point in democracy. And I don't know if um, news organizations are effectively sounding that message. Um, you know, the sky is literally falling and it seems like we're cautious in, in conveying that. And, um, you know, we are seeing in, in real time what happens. Um, I mean, with journalists literally free, fleeing Russia, um, you know, what happens without a free press, without a, in, an independent media? Um, and we've also done things, we, we, we were at a point of interrogation of how we've always done things. Um, this may not work anymore. <laughs> to be honest, this because that's we're not in this kind of world. And um you mean the same it, side on, on the one hand, on the other yeah, hand, the way yeah, kind of yeah. NPR I does mean, it. If you can't advocate full throat on behalf of democracy without having to engage in both sideism, where is that? You, you, we're not serving the public. Um in We've seen the push by the national media, by the, the Times and the Post in recent years toward that direction. Their, their willingness to call a liar a liar, call out a lie, to call out racism by its name. It, it seems obvious, but it, it was not how we did things traditionally. And um, that's not the world we live in now. And um, we, I think, to the extent that news organizations more fully embrace an advocacy on behalf of democracy, on behalf of the empowerment of all people, it will serve us. Close this out, Dr. Perryman. I, I just think I should endorse everything Michael just, just said. And that's what we that's what we tell when I have to explain to freshman students what journalism is and what they might, might, why they might want to major in it. I tell them it's, it's truthful storytelling. It's holding, you know, holding power accountable. It is calling it like you see it um, and being as fair and open-minded as possible. But, you know, this view from nowhere that only benefits those currently in power is not, <laughs> is not objectivity. Objectivity is the process of journalism. It is finding information, evaluating it, presenting it, being transparent with who you talk to and where you got it. That's objectivity. It's the process of creating a story. It's not the information itself that's objective. And it's certainly not the journalist because we're not robots. Um, we have perspectives. We just look to provide information in a way that, that helps people, helps inform them, helps them care more about democracy, makes them feel more connected to their communities. And that's what local journalism does and that is why it's so critical that we maintain it and however whichever way we can come up with next i'd like to fit in a question from an attendee for jump ball for anybody to attend it cynthia davis asks i teach at christopher newport and i'm currently the sole faculty member dedicated to launching a brand spanking new journalism minor what would you say are the top ideas concepts concerns i should consider in building our program jump ball any um journalism program i think needs to um, be about more than journalism. It, it's got to be much more about the technology and the economics of the industry and the demographic study of the industry than it's traditionally been. We've got, I mean, just some of the things we've talked about, which um, um, Shireen and Mallory know a lot more about than I do, just have to be much more in the forefront. Um, I mean, it, it's got to be that's kind of a course, not only in the survival of democracy via journalism, but the survival of journalism as a business. Shereen, last word. On the journalism school. Um, I would just say I would encourage you, Cynthia, to, um, again, to teach your students that there are ways to do it that aren't just like repairing what's broke, right? Uh, being, being creative, um, I think technology is part of it being audience centric is part of it. Um, having increased diversity in who gets to tell the story and focus on what stories get told. So um, I would just encourage you to look at the newer models that are being created rather than just teaching back in the day. <laughs>
Can I also add a, a practical piece of advice? Um, I would I would not silo out different mediums. We're beyond that at this point. We actually still have our journalism program divided into digital and I guess opposed to analog. Um, and all digital, that. right? <laughs> right. It's all, it's all and our students. You know, my students are really thrilled to watch it to write in broadcast style because we write in all caps and we don't use AP style. But then I'm like, oh, by the way, you got to like be able to put your story on the web <laughs> at some point and you got to you got to write like a newspaper. And they're like, oh, man. Um, but that that being that nimble to go between writing for print and broadcast. And I always tell my students, you're going to be better at one or the other. You're going to be bad at both or whatever. <laughs> but, you know, you're going to um, you got to be able to do a little bit of everything. So there's just not a lot of sense anymore in, in dividing it up. And we still do. But that's because it's a curriculum and it takes a long time to undo once you've done it. By way of Bryn, can you speak to how a person can identify media bias in themselves? It's always easy to see it in others, but what are the red flags that we also have our own biases to deal with and how can we actively work against that in ways that may not be obvious? Well, we all have it. That's just the spoiler. <laughs> it's impossible um, one of the main things that I study is something called the hostile media bias, which is what it sounds like. We tend to see hostile bias in news, regardless of whether the news is biased or not. Um, and it's, it's almost always against our own viewpoint. Um, this is a very curious media effect without getting too nerdy on you. But when we see the same information packaged in a non-mediated format, such as a student essay or something, you'll call it neutral. And then suddenly it's packaged in a news format. And regardless of the source, you'll suddenly start to see more bias against your point of view. And typically we sort of traced it back to this idea that people are very concerned about how news will impact other people. No one, no one thinks news is going to have an ill effect on them, but they're very concerned about everybody else, especially people in the opposing political party. So there's this sort of paternalism at work here where we're just we're constantly on guard, concerned about, that's why we're concerned about dis disinformation, right? We have these great research studies on fake news and people will be like, well, do you, do you fall for fake news? And people will be like, nah. And you'll be like, but do other people? And they'll be like, all the other people fall for the fake news. <laughs> and of course they don't, right? This is not, there's actually not a lot of people that do, but enough do um, that it freaks everybody out. Um, but in terms of, I think everyone always expects me to say, that you should have a diverse set of news organizations <laughs> that you follow and like that somehow you should be like watching equal amounts of Fox and MSNBC. And that's just never going to be my recommendation. Um, my recommendation is always consume more local news <laughs> um, because they're not going to see the same amount of bias rise within you when you're reading local news because the issues just generally aren't as charged and they don't tie into the general polarization of our political environment. But um, I will say that most national news organizations are, they're kind of interchangeable in a lot of ways. Like you're just kind of getting the, the basic same information and you kind of pick your favorite. And it's always a good idea to have a few different ones that you follow. But um, in general, I think you're pretty safe with most what I guess what I guess mainstream is actually kind of branded as bad now, but <laughs> you're, you're pretty safe with most of them. Um, if you, or you could go with what my students do and they just find the people they like to follow and they find them on the Twitter. They do not find them on the Facebook, by the way, Robin, I thought you were gonna say that you walked into a classroom and asked how many students had Facebook. And I was like, oh no. No, this is eight, this is eight years ago when Facebook was fairly hot, but all them out of Netflix still there. Log in and yeah. They're gone now, yeah. Yeah, they're gone. <laughs> I'm still there, <laughs> they're gone. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'll burn you a, a, a CD with a copy of my podcast or something, right? <laughs> uh, Michael, do you have any examples of how a local take on a national story was important and shed light on a subject that a national story did not, could not report on in the same way? Hmm. I wonder, 2020. Well, I mean, the most obvious one for me is the one we covered intensely here in Richmond, um, the monuments. Um, <laughs> that's... I mean, that wasn't, it was becoming a thing on the national level, but I think local newspapers were covering their own monument issues locally. Um, and I don't, I think it later captured the imagination of the, of the national public, but, but they're just, I think that's the thing with news. I mean, what's gonna happen if local newspapers go away? I mean, we, you know, a lot of these stories that we view as, I mean, what, how would the Buffalo shooting look if there weren't, there wasn't a Buffalo paper to report, for instance, um, just the glaring contradiction between the ability to bring in a mass shooter 
who was literally still holding his weapon mm. without taking his life. And the very real people in Buffalo that they could recall instantly who under far less dire and, and challenging and, and, and threatening circumstances died at the hands of police. So, you know, it's important that we have these local newspapers and local outlets to provide that sort of perspective that, you know, a national reporter parachute shooting in wouldn't necessarily have access to or no. Question over the transom, what would be a constructive role for public education in promoting abilities to evaluate quality of information sources? Shireen. I'll just say, you know, there's this wonderful organization called the Trust Project. Mallory, I don't know if you know them. And that's part of what they do is they have curricular material and ways you can sort of like check your ability for things like detecting fake news or determining, um, you know, fact from argument. It's some crazy statistic of Americans that actually can't like really distinguish between the two. So getting back to my earlier point, I do think it is somewhat of a failure of, of education, not to blame the teachers, but something is something is happening where people are coming out with a high school diploma, um, not really sure the difference between fact and argument. So places like the Trust Project are creating materials. Um, I would love to see like every high school, just like we've always had civics, I'd love them to have a class where you not just read the newspaper, but you like you talk about it, you analyze it, you know, you learn to kind of do some of your own fact checking and assumption checking. Um, I think that kind of critical thinking just, just has to be taught. <clears throat> You know, it reminds me of a New York Times staffer, I'll never forget this, went to the Hamptons or something over the weekend with her family uh, just a few years ago. She was a copy editor and the child actually, I shared this in an episode, they were at some sort of uh, uh, deli or something that had stacks of the New York Times and said, mom, look, they have the New York Times printed out. <laughs> <laughs> that actually happens or there's that other anecdote that said look somebody has a 3d uh you know uh, a, a 3d printout of a of a save icon which is an old floppy disk they found in their mom's home office i mean again like this dates me back professor to my time at the robertson school every time i go back it's a new indicator of how obsolete i am i mean I, if i want to talk with the youngs now about facebook and insta forget it but maybe i mean I hope, I don't think it'll necessarily work out this way, but think about what happened with vinyl music. Right. I mean, we, we, we went for the shiny, um, the shiny object of um, CDs and, and then digital music, but soon came to realize they didn't sound as good, that they pressed all the sound out of it. And, and maybe, Maybe there's a lesson in that somehow for newspapers. But is um, it, some is people it, say it's more like eight, eight newspapers, more like eight tracks. But, but is it is the, is the printing press an albatross? I mean, you think back to your time here over the 40 years and, and Tallheimer's and Miller and Rhodes and the full page advertisements and the car dealerships. And if you wanted to sell a futon, all that stuff went to the local paper and it was thick. And the local paper, you know, I drive through I drive through the countryside and stuff and I see those old Richmond Times press leader things that they'd hand out to hold your newspaper, the plastic mailboxes. I mean, at some point, you know, you have significant fixed and variable costs. And if maybe it's just smarter at some point to pull off the thing and go all digital. I mean, certainly well, this how, has been discussed with the how Times How long have we had printing presses? How long? I mean... We printed Bibles. <laughs> I mean, it, it's we're talking centuries. I mean, I think it'd be foolish to write off. I'll just say in my in my in my little town here in in New Jersey, I'm in Central New Jersey, and there was a family owned chain of twelve local twelve weeklies, right? And it was printed. It was thin, but it. it I moved here a few years ago. Started getting a subscription. I love it. It's like your kids on the first day of snow, they have pictures of them sledding. They've got the school board meeting. They've got the lacrosse tournament. You know, they've got who's running for mayor. They've got the, they've got all of it, but they were they were struggling. And a, a nonprofit consortium just came in and it was a long process. They had a whole bunch of community meetings. They struck a deal and they're going to be all converting all. I believe all 12 will still make it. So at least those communities will have their news. So I, I, I don't think papers are dead. You know, we just have to find alternative ways to, uh, to sustain them. <clears throat> Shereen, I have, a com I have a comment uh, here. Oh, sorry, Michael, go ahead. When's the last time somebody hacked a print edition of a newspaper? Uh, can you, Shireen, talk a little bit about exactly what INN does and how we as news consumers can support the work? You've mentioned yes. both members. 
Thank and you. A lot, right. and, and she and Bryn wonders if everyone knows what you mean by that. Right. So the members are the news organizations. So we have about 360 members. They're all editorially independent, nonprofit 501c3 organizations. To be members, um, if there's an application process, we ask that our members be primarily um, reporting focused. So, you know, it's great to have restaurant reviews and all of that, but you really have to be out there getting original news coverage. Um, we ask our members to be uh, practice financial transparency so that anyone can see, I, I believe it's donations of $5,000 or more. We like to be not anonymous so that people can follow the money. Um, and the members are also nonpartisan. Part of being tied up, part of being a nonprofit means they actually don't make political endorsements. Um, so unlike the New York Times, they, they cover politics, but they don't uh, have essays uh, taking, taking sides. Um, so the members are across the United States in virtually every state, the Caribbean, North America. And I did put a link in the chat, findyournews.org is our directory. You can search by state, city, or even a topic. Like if you just wanna follow immigration, uh, criminal justice, we have members that cover everything and please do go and, and support them. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. The Times Dispatch got out of the um, endorsement business a few years ago and I think Maybe most it's smart. I don't know. When most papers are realizing it's a waste of time, especially <laughs> in this polarized environment. Let me ask you one thing, Michael. I always wonder is uh, a columnist, especially. I remember when the Times was, New York Times was shifting in and out of online strategies, put it all up, metered paywall, you know, uh, no free articles, all free articles. It was the the nationally known opinion columnists, Maureen Dowd and Tom Friedman's and everything, that pushed back the most because. If you pay all this stuff, it's not going to multiply. It's not going to go forth. It's not going to spread around as easily. Yeah, um, that's tough. I I will say this. Um, you know, I, I used to really desire to be syndicated, and now um, as part of a newspaper <coughs> chain that has like seventy two, I think, different outlets. Uh, I, you know, people are like, hey, I saw your work in the Tucson paper or the St. Louis paper. So, you know, online has had that effect where you can, you know, paywalls or no paywalls. You know, I'm sure I'm being read by more eyes than, than, than ever. Huh. But yeah, it, you, you, you worry about, um, you know, just y yet another way in which people are shut out. Um, informationally, um, uh, who may have less means. Um, so yeah, it's always, I mean, I, I think it was the right instinct um, from a spiritual and, 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 and news mission standpoint to make it free, but from a business standpoint, that's another matter. Do we have any other questions coming in? I don't see any right now, Robin. Anyone? I would say like sometimes when we're doing the radio show, you know, if there's a little time at the end, I say, you know, this is like the old roller skating. This is free skate couples, everybody, you know, we've got the air <laughs> supply playing. Jump in if there's something you'd like to plug, Twitter handles, developments, things I missed, things I should be reading. ProPublica, Shireen. <laughs> I mean... We love ProPublica. I mean, no, Tell me yeah, how that was... happened. I, I just remember hearing about the first time it was one of the Dow Jones top editors went off and did it. And now they've really covered themselves in glory with various investigations, partnering with newspapers and public broadcasting affiliates, yeah. big and small. Yeah, I mean, and our, you know, the big members like ProPublica, I mean, they're winning Pulitzers, you know, so it's, yeah, it is, it is possible. One thing I'll just, I'll just say that we did a compensation study. I mean, Granted, journalism does not pay well. We did a compensation study because we were curious to see whether our reporters were getting, you know, far below market scale. And actually, they're actually they're they're not. So I just want to make it really clear: this is this is not. It may be a calling, but it's it's not a volunteer calling. <laughs> you know that we we do still have to find ways to pay these reporters and give them benefits. Um, so even if the content is free, it's still a business, and and we still have to have the revenue to to drive it. <clears throat> What you all were speaking earlier about the Trump bump. I mean, what do you think produced that? Was it alarm? What, 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 or just the fact that he was such a great story in, in, in the 
maybe great being the wrong word, but such a provocative story. What what caused the, the Trump bump for papers like the Times? You know, we had a Trump bump in enrollment in journalism schools too. Really? So it's like water, it's like Watergate. It was it was Watergate. Watergate to a lesser extent, but it was people compared it to that. The enrollment bump was very real. We thought it was kind of a fluke, and then <laughs> it became apparent that there there really really was. Um, and I, I the most of the students. I don't know if it put it, maybe it just put it on their radar, I think, in a way, um, and, and also scared them. <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's another question, uh, Dr. Perryman, is uh, some of the Joe Rogan stuff got a lot of pushback in that it is on Spotify and journalistic platforms, actual journalists who realize that that's an important platform if you want to be on all podcatchers every way, were a few months ago saying, I'm going to pull my, voluntarily pull my pod off of Spotify to punish them for giving all this money to a person who mm. is a quasi journalist. I mean, he's pra he, he allows for disinformation and hydroxychloroquine and this other stuff to get in. And, um, you know, Spotify in its defense is saying we're just a platform. Can you just be a platform? Can you be a Facebook? Can you be a Twitter? Can you be someone out there saying that it's not our job to police the content and the quality of the news sources? It's mm. for you to opt in and out. Well, and Facebook tried to do that by saying it wasn't their problem to deal with misinformation on their site and they got, you know, raked over the coals for it um, and had to have a whole, you know, congressional hearing over it. Um, and, you know, Twitter, well, pre-Elon Twitter, <laughs> has taken a hard stance against disinformation on its platform and Spotify sort of stepped back um, from making that decision. I guess stepping back from it was sort of making a decision by not drawing a line. Um, and that's an interesting, we, we love talking about that in journalism classes because um, there's two sides to it, right? Do you want um, the government regulating um, conversation platforms, right? It cuts both ways. What would you prefer <laughs> to have them do the right thing, whatever you consider the right thing to be voluntarily or to be told they have to do it from a regulation standpoint? And of course, anytime there's any mention of regulations anywhere near where news is shared, um, we get a little, <laughs> we get a little nervous um, just because it can so quickly go the wrong way. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a really fun, it's a really fun topic to debate. And my students typically do debate that pretty, pretty heavily. But see, Twitter is not a news organization. Correct. <laughs> and, and, you know, I mean, this, this is kind of what bugs me about the information age, this new information age. Um, where anyone who has a keyboard and, and blogs thinks they're a journalist. And, and, and we have these platforms like Spotify and, 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 and Facebook and others that, that don't. Ethics was always a big part of what we were taught as journalists. Ethics. There's an ethics to this that separates real journalists from people who are putting out hmm. just whatever, information, misinformation. And we can't, you know, I don't think if, if you got a president who's basically fomenting insurrection on a platform, that's got to be regulated. You know, I think Elon Musk is mad and to, to, to even entertain the idea of bringing Trump back on Twitter. And, and if he's doing it, it's strictly for the money. And I, so, yeah, I don't, I have no problem regulating those sites because they're not news sites. Hmm. Well, and one thing we've always had that's very interesting about journalism in the United States is, of course, there's no registration process for journalists, right? There's no technical, hopefully there's never going to be a roster of, of journalists and where they live. Um, we don't have a, we don't have a licensing program. We're not really a professional organization. We're sort of self-identified in a way. Um, and, you know, you, there's a whole very famous bit from, from John Stewart on Crossfire about how he's not a journalist and he didn't see himself that way. He's a comedian, right? Um, but it was totally up to him to see, you know, does, but a lot of other people saw um, his show, The Daily Show, as part journalism, part entertainment. There's definitely that space. And I think Joe Rogan was a really good example of that, of these people who sort of, they're like on an advocacy mission, but they're they're like, they don't really say they're journalists, but they're like kind of doing a lot of journalistic things, but then other things that are not journalistic, but it's definitely been a profession that's been governed, self-governed 
um, sort of by tradition more than anything else, we sort of pass these ideals down. Um, and that does make it, it, it's always made it a little murky, um, but I agree that of course, Twitter is not a newsroom. <laughs> but, but to your point about regulation, um, we had CPAC, bunch of conservatives bending at the knee of Viktor Orban in Hungary, an autocrat. And, and I don't think that's gotten nearly the coverage. It should, I mean, just the idea that basically an in, you know, the, the better part of an entire national political party is going to Hungary to take notes on autocracy. What does that mean? And if, if we're not extremely alarmed about this development, about what it means for our institutions here, I mean, is the end game to regulate journalists, to create state journalism, to do with the courts? And our courts aren't perfect, for sure. We can see what's happened with our courts already, but to do with the courts, what's happened in Hungary. Um, if you're not, Panicking, you're not paying attention right now. And I'm just surprised, you know, coming after the the the, the twenty the twenty sixteen election interference, that there weren't enough things between that and the insur insurrection and the amount of misinformation. Forget people to list this as a kind of a top five pressing concern where you know, the polls go out and everything. I just remember, I, you know, in college for junior year, I wrote a paper on electoral reform. And there are all these pressing issues about parity and equal time and the threat of minoritarian rule and all the, you know, the electoral college and things that have come to pass. But imagine getting in front of, of, of the Senate and waving a bloody shirt. Like there's no urgency for that. Or even a person before September 11th having to warn people about airline security. It's kind of like get in line behind these various, various other crises and um none of which we're paying attention to by the way by the way i mean you talk about <laughs> victor orban and there's this crisis is manifested again today in san antonio tragically and there are all these times where you thought there would be a tipping point moment um guns it, you know we have Love a bunch it. of great we have a bunch of great links that we referenced that Catherine and uh bryn posted to the comments section uh Attendees, speak now or forever hold your peace. I, I feel very satisfied and I'm grateful to have been a part of this. Uh, are there any developments or headlines or links or handles you'd like to throw in, dear panelists? I could say Bueller, Bueller, no one. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really grateful for this. Um, I love it. We cover it quite a bit. You know, we do it on the, the full disclosure briefing. It's it's walloping Virginia because, you know, I didn't even mention Style Weekly, which was a bit of a foil back in its heyday to, you know, here in Richmond, to the Richmond Times Dispatch. It would uh, it would shame the elites in a way sometimes that the Times Dispatch years ago wouldn't do. And now that's gone. Tribune just unceremoniously shut it down last year. And and uh, one of the public broadcasting affiliates bought it, but it's not really staffed. Uh, we don't know if the print edition is coming back. And meanwhile, Alden Global, the hedge fund that's pursuing Lee, the parent of the Richmond Times-Dispatch, it could get a whole other bunch of Virginia papers if it emerges victorious. And it's not like, you know, as you can see, if not if, if Lee successfully fends off this hedge fund, it's not the, the panacea, it's not the paradise, the promised land for journalists because it's still publicly traded. And it's promising shareholders a particular margin. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm feeling it very personally right now because you don't want to live in a news desert. So. Yeah, I mean, we, we think a local, we think of democracy in a certain kind of way, but I mean, democracy little, literally means power to the people. And, you know, if we're not, if, if, if local journalism organizations aren't covering poverty, um, that's bad for democracy. I mean, it's not just about covering elected officials. Um, if we're not policing the police, that's certainly bad for democracy. Um, so if we're not covering education or if education is politicized to the point that it's being politicized currently, that's bad for democracy. Hmm. So local newspapers are essential to democracy. And um, to the extent that they decline, it's good for no one. 
thank you, panelists, Michael Paul Williams, Pulitzer Prize winner of the Richmond Times Dispatch, Sharina Zimi of the Institute for Nonprofit News, and of course, Dr. Mallory Perryman right here at VCU's Robertson School. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed and appreciated this. <laughs>